Good morning, my brothers and sisters. I'd like to welcome you all to worship here at First United Methodist Church in Los Alamos. A special welcome to our guests this morning. For those who are worshiping with us online, thank you for welcoming us into your home or wherever it is you're gathered for worship this morning. I'm John Nash, the pastor. I'm joined in worship leadership this morning with Christine, who is our lay reader. Uh, Yelena is on piano. Valerie will be leading us in hymns. In the sound booth, we have Don, James, Mariana, and uh, Sam, and Kim, and Ann are our ushers. So thank you to them for their worship leadership this morning. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, said, whoever you are, whatever faith you were born into, whatever creed you confess, if you've come here to find God, to encounter God, you are welcome here. And we are indeed glad that you are with us as we continue in our Lenten series on creating a vision for this congregation. And so we hope that you have come with the expectation that we will encounter the risen Christ, that the Holy Spirit will be moving and working amongst us here this morning, that we'll be transformed by gathering together as the body of Christ. And a part of our Lenten practice, we are beginning worship uh, each Sunday with a centering prayer, a breath prayer. And so I'm going to invite you to get into a, a place where you feel comfortable as you're sitting, um, to be able to focus and center. And then as you're taking a deep breath in, if you'll put that um, slide up. I'm going to say, take a deep breath in, sighing to yourself, guide us, O oh God. And then breathing out, saying, show us your path. And then we'll close um, that by singing Spirit of the Living God. So I invite you to close your eyes and center your presence here. Call for God to be with us in this moment. Take a deep breath in. And breathing out. Center and focus on your breathing. Seeking God's will for our lives. And as you are comfortable, remain seated if that's more comfortable, as Christine will lead us in our prayer of confession. Gracious God, I'm going to do it here. Gracious God, we come before you in need of forgiveness and grace. You call us to trust in you completely, but we do not. We are timid and fearful as we follow your lead. We justify our actions and words, though we know they are not what you require. We struggle to understand the new life Christ offers, preferring old habits to risky change. Forgive us, we pray. Help us to be born again into the life of Christ, trusting that you have included us by grace in the family of faith. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, if God is for us, who could be against us? 
For that very reason, God sent the Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved and redeemed through him. Hear and believe the good news in Jesus Christ. We are forgiven. And so I invite you to remain standing as you are comfortable as we continue worshiping through song as we journey through these 40 days of Lent. our faith together. We believe that our lives are held within the encircling love of God, who knows our names and recognizes our deepest needs. We believe that Christ is the divine child of the living God, and that his grace is like living waters that can never be extinct, exhausted. We believe in the birthing, renewing, enabling spirit of God, who yearns over our welfare as a mother yearns over her child. We believe that God is in the earth desert as well as in the green pastures, and that hard times and disciplines are also loving gifts. We believe that our journey has a purpose and a destination and that our path leads to human glory we cannot yet imagine. We believe that in the church, we are fellow pilgrims on the road, and that we are called to love one another as God loves us. This is our faith, and we are humbled to profess in Jesus Christ. Amen. May be seated. (laughs) 
Together, let us pray our prayer for illumination. O God of our journey, as we read and hear the word, open our eyes and ears, hearts and minds to see your visions and dream your dreams in order to do your work in the world. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from Paul's letter to the Romans. Paul has been giving instructions about righteousness and faith. Since everyone falls short of the glory of God, as he says, then our righteousness and salvation cannot come from what we do, but from faith itself. And then he turns to the example of Abraham to make his point. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. What then are we to say was gained by Abraham, our ancestor according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now to one who works, wages are not reckoned as a gift, but as something due. But to one without works, trusts him who justifies the ungodly. Such faith is reckoned as righteousness. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents to the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath. But where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Our second reading comes from the 24th chapter of the book of Joshua. Joshua has grown old after having led the people into the promised land and defeated their enemies. And he calls together the people to renew their covenant. And then he gives a message from God about the things that God has done for them. The Lord says, I gave you a land on which you had not labored and towns that you had not built. And you live in them and you eat the fruit of vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Then Joshua says, Now, therefore, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery, and who did all those great signs in our sights. He protected us all the way that we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites, who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God, and he will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, 
you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. He said, then put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, the Lord is our God, we will serve and him we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made statues and statutes and ordinances for them at Sechem. This is the word of God for the people of God. If you have celebrations or concerns or hopes to lift up to God this morning, you are invited to come forward and light a candle. You may also fill out a prayer card to be lifted up in prayer later during worship. For those worshiping online, you are also invited to light a candle where you are and put your prayer requests in the comment section as we sing of the promises we have in God. If you've not already been using your scripture insert, I invite you to take that out. On the back is a place to write things to remember from today's service. So this year represents the 80th anniversary of the closing of the Los Alamos Ranch School. I've seen different dates on graduation and closure. One said January 23rd, another said April 15th. But regardless, the Army's Manhattan Project, with which we are so familiar, took over the school and its buildings and the Mesa in the, prop in the spring of 1943. And so while we have this idea, or we might say the larger world has this idea, that the, or the Army sort of created Los Alamos out of nothing, the fact is, there were actually buildings and houses here when they started. They didn't expect to actually have thousands of people end up working here. They later admitted that if they had known how many people it was going to take to, to make the Manhattan Project, they would have chosen another location. And then where would we all be? But it seemed like the right place for so many reasons for a small collection of scientists to be able to come together in secrecy, and they didn't have to build homes or uh, labs or, you know, the, uh, the lodge. It was all right there for them to start. They didn't have to create this from scratch. And while many people who originally came here probably did not think of Los Alamos as the promised land, in fact, I'm sure that some of them said some not choice words that we couldn't repeat here as soon as they came into the area. But many came to love the place as much as we do. 
But like those who first came, we might also take for granted what it is that we have. Or maybe even think that we produced all of the fruit that we are harvesting now, for lack of a better metaphor. And in that, we're not much different than our ancestors, including those ancient Israelites. And I think that passage we just heard from Joshua is a, a great reminder of that. Many of you probably don't know much about Joshua other than Joshua judges Ruth, which is not very nice. It's a little Bible humor. For, those are the orders of the books there. But Joshua takes over after Moses died and leads the people into the promised land. Right? They've been there for quite a while now. It's Joshua who leads them into military victory over the enemies that they have. And they become successful, and apparently, according to this passage, they've let it all go to their heads. Even though they have made a covenant with God, that's one of the things they do after they enter into the promised land, that they are going to, to worship and serve God, they sort of stop doing that. At least that's what we're told here. The people want to say, we did all this. We built this, we plowed these fields, all the, the fruit that we're bringing in, the harvest is all our hard work. And then we're even told that maybe they begin to start worshiping other gods. And it could be that they're worshiping the gods of the people around them. It could just be that this sort of metaphorical, they're worshiping gods of property and, and wealth and privilege and prestige, just to name a few. But Joshua gathers the people together and God says to them, I gave you a land on which you had not labored and towns that you did not build and you live in them and you eat the fruit of vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. That is God reminding them that they may be prospering, but God is the one who gave it to them in the first place. The homes were already there. The fields were already tilled. The vineyards and orchards were already planted. That is, that they may have had to do hard work in order to maintain all of these things, in order to harvest it all and to prepare for the next year to keep it going. But the hardest work, that foundation, was given to them already by God. Now, in some ways, that's related to that passage we heard from Romans this morning about Paul emphasizing that we are saved by faith alone. And some of the reason that Paul emphasizes this, he said, because if we're saved by our works, if salvation or righteousness is dependent upon our actions or the actions of Abraham is the example he's giving, then he says we could boast about it. And perhaps then we might even begin creating hierarchies of salvation and of righteousness. And the more work you do, the more righteous you are. And the more that we are better than others. Or at least we want people to think that we're better than others. But once again, Paul is telling us, God says, you didn't build that. You didn't give yourself salvation. You did not make yourself righteous. This is all a gift that we have received from God. Our salvation is a gift that we have received from God. Righteousness is a gift we receive from God. It's a blessing given to us. Not because of what we have done, but because of who we are and whose we are. That we are God's people and God is our God. We didn't earn any of it. God gave it to us freely as a gift, and so we should give credit where credit is due. So then Joshua says to the people, they need to choose this day who they are going to worship and serve. And then famous line from Joshua, he says, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And then he says to the people, what are you going to do? Whom are you going to serve? And he warns them they should not make this decision lightly. Because to say that you are going to serve the Lord means you're going to put everything else behind you. 
And put God first. Put God primary. As Jesus says, you can't serve God in anything else. Because you can't have two masters. You will love one and hate the other. And so Joshua says, don't take this on lightly. If you are not ready to put God as your primary, don't make that commitment. But as for me and my household, that's what we're going to do. But the people say, no, we're going to serve the Lord. And so Joshua again makes a new covenant with the people to uphold that promise. And so where do we find ourselves in that story? Well, I hope it starts with that confession of faith and the desire to put everything else behind our commitments and dedication to God, especially as we think about who we are called to be as a church. What is our vision? Number one on our list of values is that we are Christ-centered, that we are going to say Christ, God, is our primary focus. That's who we will serve. So can we actually say that together? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So if you remember nothing else from today's message or this Lenten series, I hope you will remember that phrase from Joshua and make that, possibly that becomes your breath prayer or your prayer for this Lenten season. This starts with this confession. As Methodists, we also believe this is not just something we make one time. But we have the opportunity to make this confession every single day. Actually, we have the, the opportunity to make it every single moment of every single day. Because we believe that we are moving on to perfection. But that means we're sort of on this continuum, moving back and forth, doing the right thing and doing the wrong thing. And so it means we celebrate those times in which we are trying to live lives of righteousness and, and loving our neighbor as ourselves and praying for our enemies, doing those things that Jesus calls us to do, that we should celebrate those, but also not rest on our laurels because the next moment is a new opportunity to go both ways. And it also means that when we make mistakes and we don't live into God's righteousness, that we can put that behind us, repent and turn and try to, try to start living in God's righteousness, trying to start doing all those things. It's a new opportunity to make this pledge again that we will serve the Lord. And notice it says we will serve, which is not about just believing. It's about doing and it's about listening because what do servants do? They do what their master tells them to do or instructs them to do. So when to say I'm going to serve the Lord says God is my master. I'm going to do what God is calling me to do. And what that confession of faith also says is that we are going to recognize the faith of all those who have come before us, who have set that example for us, who have made that same commitment, that same dedication over the millennia. And so if we're talking about the things that God has already provided for us, our, our strengths and our opportunities, which is a question we posed for this week... That's a good place to start because I think that's the beginning of the foundation on which we have to build our faith and build our understanding of who we are as a people. And to see the vision and the faithfulness of those who came before us, more specifically those who founded this congregation. Those who had the vision and the desire to create a Methodist church in Los Alamos. And did the work to bring us to this location. And did the work of the many different uh, structures that have been here on this property. The different forms the building has taken over time. And we stand on their shoulders today. They are our strengths. And one of the things that people mentioned was the faithfulness of the members of this church and our desire to grow and deepen our faith and to answer that Joshua question in the affirmative that we will serve the Lord. 
and also named as strength was a sense of being welcoming and friendly and loving, which fits nicely into our, our newest saying about ourselves that we are God's love in action. And that's too is a gift that's been given to us by God. Why do we love? Because God first loved us. And honestly, again, that's the foundation upon which we build ourselves. Because if, do, if we don't do that part right of loving one another and loving the world, nothing else we do really makes any difference. Because people can tell whether that love is actually working, and they can tell whether that love is genuine as well. Because I'm sure that most of you have visited a church and they probably thought they were the friendliest church in the world, but they were not, right? Maybe you were completely ignored, or somebody said something rude to you, right? Something happened in that, and you're like, I'm not sure I'd ever go back to that church. And you might have gone to a church where it doesn't seem like they've had anybody in a thousand years, and they swarm over you, right? Fifty people suddenly on top of you, welcoming you into the congregation, So being welcoming and friendly and loving in a genuine way is an expression of our faith and a continuation of what has already been built in this congregation. And as Los Alamos continues to grow, us being able to offer community and friendship and relationship will only become more important. Because in a community that's fairly transient, in which few people were born here, right? that's increasing in numbers, but few people were born here. Most of you came here from somewhere else. That sense of needing a community when you arrive in some strange new place that might look like the promised land or maybe not, is really important. That sense of connection and community. But how we feel about ourselves doesn't really matter if other people don't know that and don't feel that for themselves. Because people, honestly, right, we mostly care about ourselves. And we can all be friendly amongst us, but if we're not spreading that out, if we're not making a difference in other people's lives, and more importantly, these days of saying, this is how we're changing the world, then we've forgotten that foundation upon which we are built. We've forgotten our primary strength. And let me add just one additional comment. As some people, or several people mentioned, having young adults and uh, youth more involved in worship, and we offer that opportunity to them just like we offer it to anybody else. And there are people who want to serve in that role, and there are some people who don't. And so the same ways I don't go to the seniors and saying, guess what? You're going to be one of our lay readers. I'm not doing that to our youth. But if you do pay attention, many of them are very involved behind the scenes. But back to celebrating and building upon our mission. Because our mission is of being God's love to the world. And it's clearly, again, built upon the foundation of those who have come before us. It's one of the strengths that has been laid down for us, and we should celebrate and recognize that. While also knowing that those things don't always have to look the same, or do the same thing, or stay the same. Right? It was Moses who led the people through the wilderness, but it's Joshua who takes them across into the promised land. And he has to deal with things that I'm sure that Moses never even conceived of. That he had new challenges and new opportunities before them that they could seize and take hold of. And the same is true for us. We have opportunities great opportunities before us to offer good news and hope and healing and, and peace and to maybe do it in ways differently than what they thought of 75 years ago. And we have the resources and assets, including financial assets, which a number of people named as one of our strengths to be able to do that. And while some of it may continue to look exactly the same as it's looked for a long time, some of it may look new. And we may begin to use the building in different and new ways. But that's tapping into the vision that people had and saying, this is what they wanted and this is how we continue to do that, but maybe a little differently than what they thought. 
that we have the fields and houses that we have inherited to use the way we need to to be Christ's disciples today with the same goal and purpose of being God's love and of making disciples of Christ, calling people into relationship with God and with each other. And that work begins, I think, again, with that proclamation that Joshua has the people make. As for me and my household, we are going to serve the Lord. And then recognizing all the blessings that God has already given to us, all the strengths that God has already given to us, all the opportunities that God is presenting to us, and giving, celebrating those things that God has done to get us to this point, to recognize the giants of the faith on whose shoulders we stand as members of this congregation. And those who pass the baton on to us to do what is necessary, to keep harvesting the fruit that they planted, and to plant new vineyards and to plow new fields where we can, to be God's people here in this place, to continue to seek God's vision for us, not just as individuals, but as a community. To continue to do the kingdom work that God has called for us to participate in. Because it's God who does the primary work and we walk alongside God doing that work. To see the amazing and miraculous future that God has laid out for us. I pray that it will be so, my brothers and sisters. Amen. And I invite you to stand as you are comfortable. Again, remain seated if that's more comfortable. As we continue through worship by seeking God's vision. And you may be seated. Before we lift up our celebrations and concerns to God, we'd like to lift up some of the work of the church. In your worship guide, you'll find a list of announcements, things that are upcoming. A couple we'd like to highlight. First is that our memorial service for Al Blackstock will be this coming Saturday, March 11th at 10 a.m., uh, followed by a reception in the Friendship Center. This Thursday, it is um, our week to host the dinner uh, for the Lenten program, the Community Lenten program being held at Bethlehem Lutheran. Uh, and so we have been asked to provide 10 uh, pots of soup along with bread. I know that as of this morning, there was four pots of soup signed up. So if you can bring a pot of soup to Bethlehem by 5.30 on Thursday, please sign up or contact the uh, church office or Julie will start calling many of you uh, to ask you to participate. So that will save us one step. And I will also be giving the message uh, at the worship service. Uh, so again, um, dinner is at 6, classes begin at 6.40, worship is at 7.30. Um, and so if you're bringing dessert up, sorry, not dessert, if you are bringing soup, uh, they ask to have it there by uh, 5.30. 
And then, once again, you're being asked to judge uh, the Ark Door Contest for the month of March. And so, again, those in the sanctuary, you'll find an insert um, starting at the um, giraffe room, which is the uh, fellowship hall, and then working clockwise around the, the rooms. Uh, select the one you think is the best, and then also mark your second choice. Uh, that last month, that's what it came down to, uh, was a combination uh, first and second um, votes, because I think there was three or four that had tied, um, so that's how we did that. So please mark your first and second choice. You can just drop it off uh, at the entryway after worship today. And then our question for this week to help prepare for next Sunday as we think about our vision. Again, for those in the sanctuary, you'll find an insert or a card in there. And it says a little bird on there because you've noticed we've been at caterpillars. And so what are obstacles we face and how do we overcome them? Obviously, birds are obstacles that caterpillars face. That's our imagery. Um, so I'm going to invite you. I'm going to give you um, some time right now. If you would fill this card out, you'll find Sharpies at the center aisle. For those who are worshiping online, uh, again, you can put it in the comment section or email us uh, what your answers are. And then you will put this into the offering plate in a few moments. So I'm going to give you a minute or so to fill that out now. Thank you for your participation in that. Again, as we pass around the offering plates within the sanctuary, you can place that into there. And you're encouraged to look at the answers, which you'll find on the window um, at the back of the sanctuary. And our tree is going to start taking um, shape. Um, they're not going to look very uh, winter-like looking dead. It's going to start taking life this week. So um, you can look for that as well. One of our expectations is that we be, will be in prayer at least once a day. And so in your worship guide, you'll find a list of um, celebrations and concerns we are aware of earlier this week. And in the scripture insert, you'll find a list of the family members of the congregation to be in prayer for. That's one of our membership vows is to pray for one another and one other to lift up. And that is to be in prayer for uh, United Women in Faith, uh, who will be traveling back from Sacramento um, today. So please be in prayer for them. So let us go to God with our prayers and concerns. God, our helper, we thank you for keeping our lives always in your care and protection and pray for any and all who are in harm's way this day. We pray for those who are walking in the midst of danger, for those who are treading a slippery path, for those exhausted and seeking relief, for those who face a mountain of worry or debt or other obstacles. Be guardian and guide, we pray, setting all our feet on your path of righteousness and peace. We pray for those who are struggling with a new challenge or call. With a major transition in life or livelihood. With those, with, tr struggling with their faith and understanding. With grief, ancient or new. Keep in, your ten care, <clears throat> keep in your tender care and mercy, O God, those who are sick in mind, body, or spirits. Those weighed down by depression or pain. Those recuperating from surgery or accidents.
Protect not, only those, protect not only us and those we love, but also the whole wide world you so love. In places of war, bring peace. In places beset by natural disaster, bring calm and restoration. Where there is unrest, unrest and injustice, make justice our aim. Where hope has grown tired and thin, lift our sights so that we may see hope beyond hope, life beyond death, and you lifted up before us. In the name of Christ, we, who gave himself for our sake, we pray, and all God's children say, Amen. So one of our membership vows is that we will support this church with our gifts. Uh, giving percentage of our income with a tithe as the goal. And there's several ways you can give. For those in the sanctuary, we'll, ushers will pass around the plates in a few moments. Uh, if you have given electronically, you can pl place your offering into the plate. That's the green card you'll find in the pew. You can also give electronically by going to our website, firstinyourheart.org, or giving through the Church Center app. You can give one time or give on a recurring basis. You can text the dollar amount you'd like to give to 84321 or mail in your church to the ch checks into the church. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for making a difference. We are indeed God's love in action. If the ushers would please come forward. Our doxology is the same tune, but different words, so you'll see those on the screen. Yeah. 
continue with our prayers of celebration through the celebration of Holy Communion. Sorry, I've got to get to the right my place. And so we invite you to remain standing as you are comfortable and be seated if that's more comfortable for you. Because Christ our Lord calls to his table all who hurt and are beaten down by the stresses of life. All who love him and earnestly seek to live in peace with one another as together we pray. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. And as we give thanks, I invite you as you are called to extend your arms in front of you as a sign of giving. Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, you brought all things into being and called them good. From the dust of the earth, you formed us into your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. When rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, you bore up the ark on the waters and saved Noah and his family and made covenant with every living creature on earth. When you led your people to Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, you gave us your commandments and made us your covenant people. When your people forsook your commandments, your prophet Elijah fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and on your holy mountain, he heard your still small voice. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the high. As we give, we also receive, and so I invite you to pull your hands into your chest as a sign of receiving. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. When you gave him to save us from our sin, your spirit led him into the wilderness, where he fasted 40 days and 40 nights to prepare for his ministry. When he suffered and died on a cross for our sin, you raised him to life, presented him alive to the apostles during 40 days, and exalted him at your right hand. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Now, when we, your people, prepare for the yearly feast of Easter, you lead us to repentance for sin and the cleansing of our hearts that during these 40 days of Lent, we may be gifted and graced to reaffirm the covenant you made with us through Christ. Because on the night in which he gave himself up for us, as he gathered in the upper room with the disciples, he took a piece of bread and he gave thanks to you and he broke it and gave it to the disciples saying, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took a cup and he gave thanks to you and he gave it to the disciples saying, drink from this all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. And one of the oldest ways of being in prayer was not to clasp your hands and bow your head, but instead to lift your arms and face up to God. So I invite you to do that as we call for God to pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and the vine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquets. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you, as you are comfortable, to continue to reach out your hands to others as a sign of blessing, as together with the confidence of children of God, we say the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, Our Father 
who art, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. You may be seated. And if our servants would please come forward. Practice an open communion table because this table is not owned by us, it is owned by Christ. So if you have any concerns of whether you're welcome, put them aside for all or welcome at Christ's table. You're invited to come down the center aisle, cup your hands, and a piece of the bread will be placed into your hands. The bread is soy, nut, gluten, and egg free. Uh, and then dip it into the juice, which is grape juice, and receive both elements at the same time. And return to your seats by the side aisle, or you can be in prayer at the kneeling rail. Come, for all things are ready. Come, taste and see that God is good. And let us pray. 
Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your Spirit, united in the body of Christ to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior, and all God's children say, Amen. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as you are comfortable for our closing hymn, reminding us that we are called not to just sit on the premises, but instead to stand upon the promises. Expectations that we'll be reading the Bible daily, and so in your scripture insert, you'll find recommended scripture readings for each day of the week. We're reading through the four Gospels uh, through the season of Lent. You'll also find uh, a prayer for the week to help you do your daily prayer and questions and scripture readings to help you prepare for next Sunday. So we invite you to take this uh, home with you and make use of it during the week next Sunday as a contemporary worship service. Hear these words from the letter to the Philippians Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So standing on the promises, go forth, celebrating the gifts of God and letting your gentleness be known to all. And may the love of the Father and the strength of the Son and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Now go be the church.